It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the government stated that they plan to set strict criteria for organizations that want to bid for health care contracts from the government's new mega-agency for health care. Will one of the criteria be excluding companies seeking private profit from public health care? Premier, Minister of Health. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I thank the member, the leader of the official opposition, for the question. But the point of the changes that we are making to modernize our health care system is to center care around patients, families, and caregivers. And there will be strict criteria for any organizations that wish to become a local Ontario health team. Generally speaking, they will be centered around um, being able to manage the funds that will be allocated to them and to spend those funds appropriately, to maintain the quality of care that's expected of them them to make sure that all health organizations are properly funded and able to deliver that care, and they will be required to continue to have patients, family members and caregivers to be included in the design and the implementation of the work that they do going forward. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it also seems that the government's planning to centre profits around their friends in right. the private sector. Right. It's concerning that the Ford government can't provide a simple answer on this, an answer that the public deserves. Yesterday, I asked specifically about private surgery services. A company called Advanced Surgical Operatory in London, Ontario, wants the government's green light to expand procedures available at their fi private for-profit surgery clinic. Will the government exclude private operating rooms from their so-called Ontario health teams, yes or no? Please tell the public. They deserve an answer. Members, please take your seats. Questions referred to the Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, here is the answer to your question. We are centering care on patients, families, and caregivers. We are strengthening our public health care system. And if there are any funds left over in any particular year that are given to any local Ontario health team, they will be reinvested back into that public health care system the next year. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker. Families have a hard time believing the government's commitment to defending public health care. The answers are not clear, and this government is not admitting to their plans when it comes to the privatization of our health care right. system. Perhaps it's because the same operating room that is so desperate to break into our health system got a personal visit from the Premier government during last year's election order. campaign. Perhaps it's because the Premier himself said that he would leave, and I quote, no stone unturned in his hunt to privatize public services like health care. So I am going to ask the Premier, why is he unwilling to make a basic commitment to keep private, for-profit health services out of their Ontario health teams? Members, please take your seats. Okay, we're just getting started. I'm going to ask the government to come to order. I have to be able to hear the questions. I have to be able to focus on what the Leader of the Opposition is saying. You would expect me to do so. Start the clock. Response. Minister. Speaker, and through you, Speaker, I would say that to the Leader of the Official Opposition, she continues to ignore the fact that about 30 per cent of our current health care services are delivered by companies that are privately owned but are paid for through the government, through our public health care system. Nothing is going to change from that under our new plan. We are modernizing the system. We want to make sure that patients and families receive the truly connected care that they need. And why, again through you, Speaker, the leader of the official opposition and her party continues this fear-mongering, yep. scaring patients, particularly seniors, not Halloween. is not responsible. We are strengthening and modernizing our public health care system to make sure that patients receive better, Response. more connected care. And that's the end. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. 
Thank you, question, uh, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Last night, I heard from residents from across Brampton about the state of their health care. They're concerned about long hospital waits and getting the services that they need, and they've already seen firsthand the risks of private for-profit hospitals when the last Conservative government made their community the guinea pig for Ontario's first private P3 hospital. This government should not be proud of their record on privatization, whether it's in P3 hospitals or home care. They have made a mess of our our healthcare system with their privatization drive. That project delivered fewer beds while draining away public health dollars into private profits. The government's omnibus health bill threatens to open the door even wider to Center, unprecedented to levels of private for-profit health care. Will the government amend their bill to keep private profits out of our public health care system? Members, please take your seat. Premier. Minister of Health. Questions referred to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, through you, I would suggest to the Leader of the Official Opposition there is nothing to amend in Bill 74 because there is no drive towards privatization. There is nothing of the sort. What we are doing is modernizing our public health care system. And the situation that she refers to in Brampton is something that, Mr. Speaker, through you, is happening across the province. That's what we're trying to fix. Yep. We have a situation where 1,200 patients every day across this province receive health care in hallways of hospitals, storage rooms, and other inappropriate places. We are trying to limit that. We want to eliminate hallway health care, make yes. sure that people receive the care in the places where they should, in safe, appropriate, clean environments, and that providers, our great health care providers in Ontario, are able to deliver the care that they want. This truly connected care is going to help keep patients out of hospitals and create safe places. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Speaker, the people of Brampton aren't looking for more private for-profit health care or a mega health agency. They know that their dollars right now are being so siphoned off into the pockets of private interests instead of being, being utilized for frontline care. They want investments in frontline care to ensure that they're not stuck in an ER hallway waiting, uh, uh, de waiting days and days for treatment, Speaker, or wondering how they can support loved ones without access to home care. They remember the last time a Conservative government promised them private for-profit health care would approve their hospitals, and the waits are longer than ever because of that ill-advised direction that this uh, party took us the last time they were in government. So will the government amend their new health omnibus bill to ensure the door is closed, closed to private for-profit health care? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Again, through you. I would say that what the leader of the official opposition is talking about is absolute nonsense. Absolute, complete, and utter nonsense. What we are doing is strengthening our public health care system. Bill 74 reflects that. We are talking about that to, uh, to hear to people in communities, and I can tell you that I have done a lot of traveling since we've announced this bill. I've been to communities across Ontario, North Bay, Bracebridge, Ottawa, Northumberland, my own riding of Newmarket Aurora, and people are excited about what we're bringing forward. Providers cannot wait to apply to become local Ontario health teams because they know right now there are many impediments that are in place through the Ministry of Health, funding silos that have been set up Response. that inhibits them from being able to communicate with each other. They want to do that. <laughs> they want to be providing excellent patient care, and that's what Bill 74 will provide. I hope you will come and support us. Join us. Thank you. Stop the clock. Members take their seats. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Speaker, I direct the uh, Minister and the Premier to the 2007 Auditor General's report that clearly shows that that P3 hospital in Brampton was built at a far, far higher cost than it should have been and delivered fewer beds than it should have been and cost us more in interest payments and operating costs over time than it should have cost us Office. because the dollars went board. into the pockets of private interests, not into the development of the proper hospital in Brampton. And last night, 
Last night, I heard that those folks in Brampton want a health care system that they can count on, not one that feathers the nests of Conservative friends. Instead, they see a government laying off nurses and health professionals, making decisions behind closed doors, and posing for photo ops at private health clinics. There is a simple way the government could gain some trust from the people of government Ontario side, today. A simple way that they can gain some trust. When the Premier refused to acknowledge on the campaign trail that he was going to privatize health care, now he can get that trust back. Will the government amend their new health omnibus bill to ensure that the door is closed to private, for-profit health care? Please stop the clock. Please stop the clock. Stop the clock. Sorry to interrupt. Member for Kitchener-Conestoga has to come to order. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry has to come to order. The member for Niagara West has to come to order. The member for King Vaughan has to come to order. Start the clock. Minister to reply. Speaker, um, again through you, I would have to remind the uh, leader of the official opposition that the hospital she referred to was built by the previous Liberal government, had nothing to do with the progressive Conservative government. So the one thing we can agree on, that the 15 years of complete mismanagement and total disregard for patients, what patients in Ontario need. That's what we're concentrating on yep. with Bill 74. There is no need to amend that bill because there is no element of privatization there. We are concentrating on strengthening our public health care system. We want to make sure that the people of Brampton and people across the province of Ontario can continue to access our public health care system for their services, that we can reduce their wait times, that we can connect their services, that we can make sure that they receive Response. faster care. All of those things are dealt with in Bill 74, so please, I would urge you to read it again and support us. Read it for the first time. Thank you. Next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. To the Premier. For months, the Premier has insisted that he has a great track record when it comes to building transit, which comes as a surprise. <laughs> Members, please take their seats. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition has the floor. Which comes as a huge surprise to people who watched him at uh, Toronto City Hall, where he did a far better job of tearing plans up rather than getting anything built. Now it looks like he's at it again, Speaker. Last night, the Toronto Star revealed that the Ford government is ripping up Toronto's transit plans and insisting that they follow a vague new plan that includes a privatized relief line. Why is the Premier meddling with long-established transit uh, plans, and why is he determined to delay and destroy transit plans that are already approved and underway in Toronto. Premier. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and through, Mr. through you, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to transportation, we're just beginning. Yeah. It is nothing you've seen yet. We're going to build proper transit here in Toronto. We're going to finally get subways built to get people from point A to point B right across the GTA. We're extending Eglinton. We're making sure we're building the downtown relief line. We're helping the people of Scarborough. My friends in Scarborough, help is on its way. We're going to be building transportation. We have a great announcement today from the Minister of Transportation. $1.2 billion of infrastructure around Ontario. We're finally getting this province moving. Here, here. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, people in Toronto simply want transit that works. Instead, they have a premier who seems more interested in wasting billions of dollars in rewriting plans, delaying construction, construction issuing demands, and privatizing transit lines so his well-connected friends uh, can turn a profit. The people of Ontario shouldn't be stuck with the bill because the premier of the province decides, once again, that he wants to play mayor of Toronto. And the people of Toronto deserve transit that works, not a plan written in crayon by the premier who's never met a transit plan he couldn't derail. Will the Premier stop meddling, stop privatizing, and work with the City of Toronto to get transit built? Premier. 
Back to you, Keep Mr. Building. Speaker. Keep building. Again, we're going to build, build, yeah. build subways, yeah. subways, subways around the GTA, around Toronto. But through you, Mr. Speaker, we're expanding right across Ontario. A great announcement happening: $1.2 billion. You'll be hearing from the best Minister of Transportation you could ever ask for. He's so busy, he can't keep up with the announcements. There's announcements every single day, no matter if it's making sure we extend the goal or making sure that we build roads and fix the roads or building the greatest transportation system in the world. Through you, Mr. Speaker, we are putting more money into infrastructure than anyone in North America. We're going to be putting tens of billions of dollars into building infrastructure across this province. Yeah. Next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. My question today is to our Premier. Last week, the Premier joined the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs and the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks down in Oxford to discuss the impacts of the federal carbon tax with some of the leaders in our agricultural sectors. Well, Mr. Speaker, farmers in my riding, they made it very, very clear that the federal carbon tax is going to cost them dearly in every aspect of their operations. Farmers are already some of our best stewards of the land, here, here. as they've made their living for generations by preserving their land for their livestock, their crops, and to pass down to their families. Here, here. Our government has been working hard to bring our farmers' cost of business down by scrapping the Green Energy Act and the disastrous cap-and-trade program. So, Mr. Speaker, and our Premier, please tell us what he has heard Question. from the agricultural industry leaders on the impact of the disgusting, harmful federal carbon tax. Great Question to the Premier. I, I want to thank our, our Chair of Caucus, plus a great MPP from Hastings, Lennox, and Addington. <coughs> He's a true leader in our caucus. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I visited uh, our, our members' riding, and he's an all-star. When you go down the street, everyone loves the member. My friends, I was out with the Minister of Agriculture. We were in the rural area, finally get out of the bubble. We call Toronto the bubble. Talk to the real people, the farmers. They're working 18 hours a day around the clock. The best stewards of the environment. Yep. Our Minister of Environment has put an outstanding plan together showing that you don't need a carbon tax that's going to hurt the farmers, hurt families, hurt businesses, because the carbon tax does nothing for the environment, absolutely nothing. Response. We've already hit 22 percent reductions. We have 11 years to hit the 30 percent mark, and we're going to not only hit it, we'll surpass it. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I certainly thank the Premier for the answer. You know, when the people of Ontario elected this government, they elected a government that will bring an end to the 15 years of Liberal mismanagement and make life more affordable again for the people in the province of Ontario. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, sadly, we are now only a few short days away from having the federal government impose, that's hey. impose their hey. carbon tax on the everyday hardworking hey. people in this province. Shame on Mr. This. Speaker, that is clearly unacceptable, yeah. and I can tell you that this tax, being the worst tax that we have probably ever seen, our Premier and this party is going to do something about it. We are going to challenge them all the way because this is unjust, it is not right, it is improper, and it has to come to an end. Premier, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> Through you, Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll give you my thoughts, and I'm going to give you the thoughts of everyone, not just in Ontario, but across this country. Yeah. People can't stand this carbon tax. Yep. It puts a burden on the backs of every single family, not only in Ontario, but across this country. It puts a burden on every single business, the hardworking people at the convenience stores that work 18 hours a day. There's no one that works harder than people waking up at 6, opening their stores at 7, working till midnight, and doing it over and over again seven days a week. It's going to hurt the convenience store owners. It's going to hurt the small business owners. 
the large businesses. We're trying to compete worldwide. We're trying to compete with one hand tied behind our back. But my friends, a warning bell is going off. The warning bell is on April 1st, you're all going to be paying four and a half cents more per liter for gas. You're going to be paying more for absolutely everything in the grocery store. It's going to be a recession when it comes to the carbon tax. We're going to make sure that the Thank you. Stop the clock. Thank you. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. When asked about the appointment of Ron Tavener as OPP Commissioner, the Premier was called the Premier called it a transparent process. The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services claimed, quote, independent selection committee, unquote, made the decision. Later that same day, a member of that very committee corrected her by reaching out to Dean Frank saying, quote, the messaging in today's legislature on the OPP commissioner uses the term independent selection panel. Independent of who? I'm the deputy minister to the premier and Ron reported to Mario when he was at TPS. I would drop the word independent, unquote. So my question, is the premier willing to correct himself here today and set the record straight, or does he stand by those questions? Stop the clock. And ask the member for Carleton to come to order. Start the clock. Premier to reply. Government House Leader. Government House Leader. Well, thanks, Speaker. Uh, the member opposite is the same member who filed the complaint with the Integrity Commissioner in Ontario. Uh, the Integrity Commissioner here in the province uh, went through an exhaustive interview process with numerous individuals who were allegedly involved in whatever the member was alleging. And when the investigation was completed, the Integrity Commissioner came out with a report, and I would like to point this out, that completely exonerated the Premier of Ontario for any wrongdoing yeah, yeah. in this case. And we appreciate, we appreciate yeah, the respect. finding of the Integrity Commissioner. We actually thank him for the investigation that he has done. And in our opinion, this matter has been put to rest, Mr. Speaker. There are a lot of other things that I know the member from Brampton, Markham and Scarborough should be asking, but they're not asking these questions on policy today. Instead, they're trying to play in the gutter and play gutter Paul. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question again is to the Premier. The Integrity Commissioner's report clearly states and clearly reveals that the Secretary of Cabinet had serious concerns about the categorization of this process as independent. Yet day after day, the Minister and the Premier stood in this House and used the very word the Secretary told them to drop. We've asked the Speaker for his view, but the Minister could clear things up today. Now that it's been revealed that the Secretary of Cabinet was telling the government not to use the word, quote, independent, unquote. Is the Premier ready to admit he and his minister were wrong to do so? Minister. Thanks, Speaker, and uh, thanks to the member opposite for the question. Uh, the report makes it pretty darn clear, Mr. Speaker. The report makes it very clear, as we said that from the beginning, that this complaint was frivolous and without merit and completely exonerated the Premier of Ontario. And I don't know why the member opposite and members opposite, including the leader of the official opposition, continues to play down in the gutter on this uh, clearly political issue that they're dealing with over there because nobody else really seems to care when it comes to this. People in Ontario want to know about the one, what the government is doing when it comes to policy and, and creating jobs. And in honour of all of those great young athletes who are here for a special hockey day today, I would say, holy Mackinac, Speaker, we've created 95,000 new jobs in Ontario thanks to the policies that we've introduced. To take their seats. Order. 
restart the clock. Next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I have a policy question, and my, speaker, my question today is for our, our Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, we on this side of the House and my PC colleagues across the, uh, the hall here are supportive of the men and women in uniform by providing them with the tools and the resources they need to keep the streets and our homes safe. My constituents in Etobicoke Lakeshore trust our government's willingness to crack down on violence committed by armed gangs, but they also appreciate our efforts to divert our youth from a path of crime and violence. Mr. Speaker, can the Attorney General please explain to this House our government's approach to break the cycle of violence in our communities through the guns and gangs strategy? Great the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for her question. Uh, I'm proud to say that yesterday our government for the people announced our the next phase of our comprehensive strategy to support the local fight against gun and gang violence in communities across Ontario. In August of last year, our government announced the first phase to fight the urgent gun and gang problem in Toronto. The province-wide second phase of this strategy addresses the threats faced by communities on all fronts through enhanced local enforcement, prosecution and prevention and intervention initiatives. One of the key elements of our prevention approach is to establish justice centres that will move justice out of the courtroom and into community setting by co-locating justice, health and social services all under one roof. This is a new model Response. of intervention in Ontario that has proven to be effective in disrupting gang recruitment and protecting young people in communities and jurisdictions across North America. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to say we are making good on our Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Attorney General for her response. Mr. Speaker, the PC candidates, we all campaigned on a province a promise to improve public safety in this province. As a member of this government for the people, I am proud to stand here today to know that our government is committed to tackling gun and gang violence across Ontario and keep criminals off our streets. I would now like to direct my supplementary question to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please outline how our investment in frontline policing will keep our families safe and tackle violent crimes in all of our communities? I know we've spoken many times on the justice and community safety file, and I know how important it is to you and the residents of Etobicoke and Lakeshore. So in addition to the new prevention and intervention measures yesterday, our government announced new support and resources to help police forces disrupt and dismantle criminal gangs and keep innocent people in Ontario safe from guns and gangs. The Gun and Gang Support Unit will support police forces across Ontario to undertake major gun and gang investigations and prosecutions, as well as improve province-wide intelligence gathering, integration and coordination. In addition, our government is establishing a dedicated gun and gang specialized investigation fund to support joint operations between uh, police forces. Our government's commitment is clear. We will not stand by and let gangs prey on our young people and destroy the security that the people of Ontario deserve and expect from their government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Brampton East. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Yesterday, we had a town hall in Brampton about our broken health care system, which packed the room with people who came to share their stories, people like Teresa. After giving birth, Teresa started to think and feel in a way that she described as really scary. She was having anxiety and irrational thoughts. Later, she found out that she was suffering from postpartum anxiety. As a new young mother, she went to Brampton Civic, and despite the best efforts from dedicated frontline workers, she had to wait hours because there were no rooms available for her. In order to be seen by a doctor, she had to share her deepest and darkest emotions in a hallway with strangers passing by. Now Teresa is pregnant for the second time, and though she's excited in the back of her mind, she's also Question. scared. She keeps on asking herself, what if I suffer from postpartum anxiety again? 
Why is this government forcing mothers like Teresa to bear their souls in public? Questions to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you very much for his question. I do agree with you. Right now, we do have a broken system where people are not receiving the care that they deserve, and the transitions from hospital home care, hospital long term care are fractured. That's what we are attempting to fix with the uh, modernization of our health care system. I share your concern and uh, your constituents' concern about receiving care in hallways. As I've indicated before, that's happening in hospitals across the province, 1,200 people each and every day. It's not an easy thing to fix. There's not one simple answer to it. We need to do a number of things on a number of fronts, but that's what we are doing with Bill 74 and also with our mental health and addictions plan. We have $3.8 billion that is being invested by the province over 10 years to make sure that people such as your constituents receive Response. the health care that they need for postpartum depression for whatever their mental health or addiction problem is. But that is what we are doing. We are modernizing our health public health care system in order to deal with situations exactly. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, in order to end hallway medicine so new moms like Teresa can receive the care with some dignity, instead of fully funding Brampton Civic Hospital, instead of converting Peel Memorial Health Centre to a full-time 24-hour hospital, and instead of building a new hospital for our growing community, this government has voted against ending hallway medicine in Brampton. My question is simple. Why? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. The situation in Brampton is um, similar to many other fast-growing communities where they are experiencing higher levels of hallway health care. We want to stop that. We want to stop that in Brampton. Yep. We want to stop that across the province. But again, the answer is not simple. One of the things we need to do is create more long-term care homes because, as you will know, the patients who are in hospital who don't need to be there anymore but have no other place to go remain in hospital for extended periods of time. That's one of the reasons why we made our campaign commitment to create 15,000 new long-term care spaces within five years. We've already attained about half of that goal, so and we're working on it on a daily basis. We also want to make sure that people receive the mental health and addictions care that they need in the community Response. so they don't need to go to the hospital as their last means of resort, and we know that many people cycle in and out of emergency departments. Finally, we need to have better uh, chronic disease management pathways, which is one of the reasons Thank you. The next question, the member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, last Thursday I was at a fundraising event in Perth for Lanark County Interval House, who provide vital services and assistance to victims of domestic violence. I was reminded of a commitment from the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services three years ago to consider a pilot project on active GPS electronic monitoring of violent offenders. Speaker, can the minister confirm if this pilot project was undertaken and share the results with the House? Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Speaker. Well, as the member from Lanark, um, Frontenac and Kingston would know, three years ago, the Liberal Party was the government in power. Um, I can assure the member that we are actively engaged with our, our uh, partners in probation and parole um, to end, frankly, the Ministry of Attorney General as a justice file collectively to study issues that are actually going to make our community safer. And what we have discovered is that there was a lack of action that was happening in the last 15 years. Uh, we have uh, signaled very strongly to our partners on both sides of the justice file, whether it's in policing or on the uh, Crown Attorney's side, that we will work together in a multi-ministerial approach to make sure that uh, the Response. individuals within our community um, continue to understand and value the importance of, of our goal, which is to make communities safer. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, again to the minister. Speaker, I didn't hear an answer whether the pilot project was undertaken or not. 
Uh, and I'm astonished that the minister would not know if it had been undertaken or not. Speaker, will the minister commit to this House to review my previous correspondence, and I can send some of it over with the page right now, uh, the correspondence with the ministry on this subject, and report back on the status of an active GPS electronic monitoring system so that women who have experienced domestic violence can have greater security than just a restraining order on a piece of paper. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. So as the member opposite knows, uh, we collectively, uh, whether in opposition or in government, have studied uh, many systems. We made uh, many uh, suggestions when we were in opposition. But um, as I mentioned, you know, this is a multi-ministerial approach that we are um, reviewing, and I want to highlight something on the violence against women violence against women, sex trafficking, and human trafficking. You know, we, we already have a current investment in our government of $174.5 million in funding for women violence against women services. Uh, we are investing an additional $1.5 million in funding for rural frontline services. I don't think there is any doubt that uh, we see challenges, whether it is in rural Once. Ontario where we have distance challenges or in urban centres where the uh, increasing prevalence of human trafficking uh, continues to become uh, something that our police services. Thank you. Next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the best Minister of Transportation. As a Toronto MPP, I am proud that our government is delivering on our promise to tackle congestion in the GTA. For too long, gridlock has immobilized Toronto and the Greater Toronto Area, costing the province billions in economic productivity and Ontarians lost time and inconvenience. Politicians here at Queen's Park and City Council have run in circles talking about transit but not getting anything done. We need less talking and more digging. We, we need to, to build a regional transit system that works for the residents of the GTA. We need to build subways and we need to build them faster. Could the minister please explain his plan to get Question. subways built so that we can finally get Toronto and the region moving? Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks, Member from Eglinton Lawrence. And flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, transit is an important issue, and our government made a strong commitment to get it built. That was our plan at the start. It's our plan now, and it's our plan going into the future. That's all it's about: is building transit, Mr. Speaker. It's not about playing political games. And it's not about saying that you're so-called stealing the transit from Toronto, Mr. Speaker. It's about building transit faster at a lower cost for the taxpayers of this province. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we campaigned to upload the subway from the TTC. We campaigned on finally giving Scarborough the transit they deserve. Yes. We campaigned on extending the Eglinton LRT. We campaigned on extending the TTC Fonts. to the north of Young Street. And Mr. Speaker, we campaigned to finally build the, the Young Relief Line. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to get it done. Yeah. Stop the clock. We start the clock. Supplementary. An answer, Minister. It's great to hear that our government for the people is sticking to its goal and its plan to build transit. We can't be sidelined by politics. We need to deliver transit projects and subways right away. Unfortunately, the usual suspects at City Hall are more interested in holding the region back and playing politics. The people of Toronto and the GTA have waited years for transit to finally get built. For 15 years, they watched the Wynn Liberals fail to get the province moving. For decades, they watched Toronto City Council fail to get the region moving. Minister, the time for action is now. Can you commit today to taking the steps necessary to get subways built and the people of Toronto and the GTA moving easily? Great question. Minister. 
Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for that question. Mr. Speaker, we're on the right track. Our government for the people are going to get shovels into the ground. Here, here. Our government for the people are going to get people moving. We need to keep going on this right track, Mr. Speaker. We will not let the NDP and the ideologues from City Council to hold us back any further, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan, and we're going to deliver that plan. We will expand transit to Scarborough. We will expand extend the Upton LRT. We will build a downtown relief line, and we will extend the TTC North and York region. That is progress for the people of Ontario, and we're going to get there. Join us on The House will come to order. Order. Start the clock. The next question is the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. With 10,000 education jobs set to vanish under the Conservative Education Plan, it's important to consider the impact that losing even one teacher will have on students in Ontario's small and rural schools. As boards meet to assess the damage, more details are slowly emerging. The Blue Water District School Board estimates at least 50 teaching jobs will be lost because of this plan. Grand Erie District School Board stands to lo lose 94 teaching positions, as well as eight additional positions that focus on secondary school programming. Speaker, how will taking away teachers help students in small and rural communities succeed? The Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to talk about how we're particularly going to be supporting schools across this province, both in urban and rural Ontario, because we have a plan that's going to work not only for parents, not only for teachers, but for students as well. And when we talk about supporting our teachers, I want to be very clear. We're investing. The province of Ontario is going to be investing to make sure that no one loses involuntarily their job. Exactly. And the numbers that are being quoted across the way actually has nothing to do but have a premise of fear-mongering, Speaker, and it's very, very sad. And it's shameful that this party opposite is just grasping onto anything to try and fear-monger amongst our students, amongst our teachers, and amongst our parents. As I said before, it is absolutely shameful because anyone who knows Bonds. anything about school boards knows that this is the time of year that school boards take a look at their roster and um, they have to work through a process whereby they give notifications. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the minister can't keep avoiding these questions. These are numbers coming from the boards themselves as a result of this minister's plan to cut education. For small and rural boards, losing teachers and support staff doesn't just limit the one-on-one -on -one attention kids deserve, it also means lost opportunities to pursue a variety of subjects. When teachers with specialized qualifications in music, arts, technology, physics, or French retire but are not replaced, those courses will be lost. High school teachers estimate 34 thousand classes could be lost under this government scheme, and that will disproportionately hurt rural schools and rural students. Speaker, the Liberals just spent 15 years attacking rural students by closing down their schools. Why is this government Question. choosing to do the same? Right on there. Minister. Well, Speaker, I can tell you this. I need to be very clear, and to everybody watching and listening to the type of rhetoric that's coming from across the floor, it's absolutely shameful the manner in which this party opposite is trying to fearmonger. Because the fact of the matter is, we are supporting our classrooms. We want the best learning environment possible. Then that means supporting our teachers, supporting our students. So ultimately, parents once again have confidence in the Ontario education system. And let me tell you what we're going to be doing. As I said before. There will be no involuntary job losses, and in fact, we're going to be working with school boards and investing to make sure nobody has any bad experience on behalf of a situation that the school boards may impose. So the fact of the matter is, again, we're investing over a billion dollars to make sure Response. nobody involuntarily loses their job, and we're going to get education in Ontario back on track once and for all. Back on, on the track. rail. Next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
My question is for the Minister of Finance. Our government campaigned on a clear commitment to bring more choice and more convenience to the people of Ontario. And the people told us, loud and clear, they want our government to expand the sale of beverage alcohol into big box stores, more grocery stores, and corner stores. We believe that the people of Ontario deserve to have more opportunity to access the products that they want to buy. And we know our government has been making progress on fulfilling our commitment to the people of Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, it's no secret that our family owes its success to its beginnings in the convenience store world. Now, with members of the Ontario Convenience Store Association in the gallery today, could the minister please reiterate our government's commitment to bringing more choice and more convenience to the people of Ontario? Questions to the Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Willowdale. Our government is committed to improving choice and convenience for Ontario consumers. That is why we invited people to share their views on the sales and consumption of beverage alcohol in Ontario through province-wide online consultations. We are currently reviewing the 33,000 responses, which will help develop our plan uh, to expand sales into corner, grocery and big box stores. We believe Ontario consumers are mature enough and responsible enough to have freedom to make the choices that are best for them. Through these changes, ensuring the safe, responsible consumption of alcohol remains our top priority. The people of Ontario told us they want to see these changes, and, Speaker, we plan to deliver. Thank you. Supplementary, the member for Aurora Oak Bridges. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank the Minister for his response. Speaker, people across Ontario are excited about the prospect of having a greater choice and convenience when buying beverage alcohol. Our government continues to make life easier for the people of Ontario, and we plan to continue this trend. But let us take a moment to once again recognize the Ontario Convenience Store Association at Queen's Park today. <laughs> Speaker, these business owners are the cornerstones of their respective communities. Here, here, here. We know they create jobs and invest in the communities they call home. They are part of the reason why our government is so focused on making Ontario open for business. Could the minister please explain the importance of the convenience stores in Ontario? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. It is a pleasure to welcome the Ontario Convenience Store Association to Queen's Park today. With over 7,500 members, half of whom are independent business owners, we're thrilled to join them this morning to talk about being open for business and open for jobs. That is why we cancelled the cap-and-trade carbon tax, which saves businesses $880 million this year alone. That is why we're giving business more time to adjust to the $14 an hour minimum wage, and that is why we continue to cut red tape and reduce the regulatory burden that businesses face. Through these changes, we want to continue supporting those in our business community who have been ignored for far too long. Response. Thank you, Speaker, and welcome. Thank you. Member for Timmins. Thank you. My question is to the Acting Premier. Yesterday, we asked the Premier whether he'd join us in asking Elections Ontario to review concerns about political party fundraising. The Premier raised serious issues here in the Assembly, and if he really meant the word he said, surely he'd want an, inv an investigation conducted. Will he add his name to the letter that we authored yesterday? Questions to the Deputy Premier. Government House Leader. Speaker, I'm not exactly sure how this has anything to do with government policy again from the member opposite, but I'm happy to tell you that uh, we have raised uh, a fair amount of money since becoming the government of Ontario because we're working hard to do that, and all of the fundraising that we're doing in Ontario follows the rules that are laid out by the legislation uh, that has been passed here in the Ontario Legislature. 
That's the same legislation that the official opposition would work within, we hope, uh, and, and members of the independent uh, realm over there. Uh, they would also have the opportunity to fundraise with those same rules in place, Mr. Speaker. And I can assure you that the fundraising that our party has done so far has been according to those rules. It's been above board, and it's actually been very successful, Mr. Speaker. So I can understand why members of the opposition Response. party, according to media reports, are a little upset because this party is selling something that the people of Ontario want to buy. They're not. Opposition come to order. Supplementary question. Well, again, to the acting premier, other members of the assembly have said they're ready to join us. In fact, some of those members sat in the government caucus not too long ago. Maybe the premier doesn't want Elections Ontario looking into his $1,250 a plate dinner and the lobbyists who were forced to sell those tickets. But we think that people deserve an answer. If the Premier doesn't agree, he should say so. Otherwise, he should join us today. Will you ask your Premier to sign the letter along with other members of this Assembly? Later. Speaker, we have the rules. We have an elections officer. We have fundraisers that happen every day. Yes, we've had all kinds of $25 spaghetti dinners that the Very Premier successful. has attended. We're really looking forward to heading out on the barbecue circuit and putting the pasta to bed for a while, having some good old-fashioned hot dogs and maybe some hamburgers, and seeing the people of Ontario, the people that are happy with the direction that this government is taking. You know, we had a big fundraiser. We had a really big fundraiser, Mr. Speaker. It was a record fundraiser, as a matter of fact. The official opposition, the NDP, they're having their own $800 a plate fundraiser. Although one they that didn't advertise it. They, they, I'm not sure, Mr. Speaker, if they followed the rules no, or I not. I so. mean, there was some question about that. There was a lot of fuzziness, and maybe there will be Fox. an investigation into that. But they're charging $800, and it comes with a special reward to spend time with the leader of the official I'm opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Order. The next order. The next question. The member for Barry Springwater, Oral Madonto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the PC, productive and competent Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Yay! Mr. Speaker, after 15 long years, the previous Liberal government got complacent and tired. Their complacently complacency caused waste and inefficiencies throughout all of government. The energy sector is an example of that waste, Mr. Speaker, and the people of Ontario elected our government to clean it up. We cancelled the wasteful renewable energy projects our system never needed. We repealed the Green Energy Act to ensure the previous government's waste wouldn't continue. Now we're taking another step towards cleaning up the hydro mess, Mr. Speaker, and I would ask the minister why it is so important we modernize the Ontario Energy Board. Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines and Aboriginal Thank you, Mr. Affairs. Speaker, not sure I can rival that acronymology, but I'll give my best effort, Mr. Speaker. I spoke the other day at the Electricity Distributors Association, and they were crying out for OEB modernization. Yesterday at the Hydro One major customer conference, Mr. Speaker, hundreds of people said, please reform the OEB. Tired of submissions in the thousands of pages, lengthy delays for approvals, Mr. Speaker, and uncertainty around costs, Mr. Speaker, and rate uh, and regulatory matters. It's time, Mr. Speaker. This is the opportunity. You know, last winter, uh, the NDP stood in this place and said, we're not delivering power for Ontario in the heart of the coldest winter. Now they're saying we're not delivering power under a transparent model suggested and recommended by the Auditor General. Now they're saying they don't stand not delivering power for a modern OEB, Response. Mr. Speaker, and they're saying we're not delivering power under good principles of conservation that protect families, small businesses, and Indigenous communities, Mr. Speaker. We're plugging the cord in, Mr. Speaker, for a brighter future and a competitive. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. There's no doubt that under this minister's leadership, the OEB will once again become a competent regulator, one that helps us increase efficiency by cutting through unnecessary red tape that's been burdening our economy for many years. Mr. Speaker, but that's not all our government is doing. We all know in this House how the previous government liked to spend money. They, they've never seen other people's money they didn't like to spend, and when they ran out of that, they borrowed and taxed to spend more. Mr. Speaker, 
Our government doesn't do that. We respect the taxpayer. Can the minister please tell the members of this House how we're respecting the taxpayers with Bill 87 fixing the hydro mess? Minister. Appropriately named uh, piece of uh, legislation, it has indeed been described uh, as a mess by not just people who pay their bills every month, but uh, stakeholders who engage the OEB. Uh, and the likes, Mr. Speaker. Listen to what the Auditor General had to say, Mr. Speaker, about things that go to cost. And this was a significant and serious complaint. It's the, the Auditor General said, uh, reducing electricity consumption through conservation efforts is of little value. Investing in conservation during a time of surplus actually costs us more. Cost, 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 Mr. Speaker. Uh, here's another one from Tom Adams and Ross McKittrick in, in 2016. Conservation programs cost about $2 for every dollar they're saved. Mr. Speaker, we're committed to keeping money in the pockets of the hardworking people of Ontario. We want to ensure that their energy bills are Response. affordable, that they see in a transparent manner how much electricity is subsidized. And moving forward, Mr. Speaker, to pursue a cut model and relieve Ontarians from the high costs of energy and the mess that was created. No, it's not. Next question, the member for York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. For eight years now, Food Share Toronto has employed, supported, and mentored up to 20 students each summer while providing them the opportunity to earn up to two co op credits. Foodshare prioritizes students who are behind in credits, newcomers, students from low-income families, racialized students, and students with learning disabilities. But because of this government's cuts to our youth, Foodshare Toronto has been unable to participate in March break job programs and spring after-school programs. Why is this government turning its back on organizations like Foodshare who arm students with the skills to allow them to succeed in today's workplace. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I'm pleased to stand and address this question in the sense that um, I need to be very clear. I want to be crystal clear. We are investing in students, and we're investing in programs that are going to see them make sure that they have the skills, the job skills, and the life skills they need to go out and and get a really good job. You know, I want to talk about just being at First Robotics up in Barrie a couple of weekends ago. It was a. I was uh, joined by Member Downey and Member uh, Cajun, and it was an amazing uh, display of teamwork of people, both mentors, teachers, excited about the students that they are enabling to embrace STEM in a very unique way. And those are the skills that they know our students need in order to move forward in jobs of today and tomorrow. And those Response. skills are the ones we're investing in and getting right once and for all in the learning environments in Ontario. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, my question is to the Minister of Education. Under this government's watch, Ontario's youth unemployment rate is 12.3 per cent, higher than the rate for the rest of Canada. Wow. This Conservative government claims to be all about jobs, but they do not seem to care about jobs for the youth in communities like York Southwestern. Leaving programs like Foodshare Toronto in the dark about whether or not they will be able to continue to employ, educate, and support students shows where the government's real priorities lie. And it is not with our youth. Right. Okay. When will this government stop balancing its budgets on the backs of our young people? Right. 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 Well, again, I want to stand in front of, of everyone in this House today and say it's our PC government of Ontario that's actually going to be able to, to tout the success that we have in making sure our students have the job skills and life skills they need for jobs of today and tomorrow. And you know, some of those skills actually involve embracing technology for good. I want to share an example of something that we've just learned about today. McDonald's in Canada, for the first time today, is accepting applications from students.
students via Snapchat. Wow. I'm telling you, Speaker, we need to Don't make sure that Take we're doing time. everything we can to Take invest in improper studies, in proper curriculum, so that our students are equipped to work with the, the means amongst them. And technology for good is absolutely a means to an end, whereby we want to make sure they have the skills to Fox. go out and pursue the jobs that they're going to have satisfaction in. And honest to goodness, Speaker, I am excited about where we're going with our Ontario education curriculum because it's going to make sure. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is the member for Peterborough Fourth. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. In Ontario, we have more than 70 organizations involved in special needs hockey, some of whom were in the House today. As we celebrate Ontario's first ever special hockey day. I outlined in my <clears throat> As I outlined in my original private members bill, Special Hockey Day coincides with the start of the 2019 Special Special Hockey International Tournament. Recognizing this day is important to raise the awareness for the many special hockey organizations across Ontario and celebrate all of these exceptional athletes. Can the minister inform the legislature how our government for the people is working to promote Ontario's first ever special hockey day? The minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, I'd like to thank the member for Peterborough Kawartha for his fantastic question and also commend him for the great work that he does advocating on behalf of people with special needs. I know how important this cause is to him, and this day shows the power that individual members can have in this place when they're passionate about a cause. I also want to thank the Minister of Finance for incorporating the legislation into the fall economic statement so that we were able to ensure the special hockey day was enshrined in law in this time. Mr. Speaker, an international hockey tournament provides athletes the opportunity to compete against the best from around the world allowing them to perfect their skills. It teaches the athletes the importance of teamwork Response. and the value of working together, and it creates memories and friendships that last a lifetime. I'm honoured, along with my colleagues, to welcome all the athletes to this tournament. Congratulations to all. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the minister for his answer. As he said, today is the opening ceremonies for the 25th anniversary of the Special Hockey International Tournament. And it's the first time it's been back in Ontario since the great riding of Peterborough Kawartha hosted it in 2017. This year's fest festivities are being held in, in Toronto at the Madame Athletic Centre, formerly known as Toronto Maple Leaf Gardens. This milestone event is being hosted by the Grand Ravine Tornadoes. And I'd like to take this time to wish all of the athletes who will be competing a safe and fun tournament. Would the minister update the legislature on how our government for the people is supporting our special needs athletes? Minister. Thank you uh, once again, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for that uh, question. Our government is committed to helping athletes with special needs realize their full potential. I'm happy to say that Special Olympics Ontario is a recognized provincial sports organization and receives funding through the Ontario Amateur Sport Fund. We also provide project-based funding to help deliver national and international amateur sports events in Ontario, like the 2019 International Special Olympics Ontario Invitational Youth Games being held here in Ontario. Our government also recognizes how powerful sports truly is to the province of Ontario. And this tournament is a great way to recognize the unique talents of special hockey players from here in Ontario. I want to echo the member from Peterborough Kawartha when I say good luck to all the athletes Response. competing in the tournament and wish everyone a very special first ever, ever special hockey day. That concludes our question period this morning.
Point of order, the member for St. Paul's. I just want to tell everyone that it's World Theatre Day, and I'd like to give a shout out to Toronto St. Paul's B Current, Tarragon Theatre, Solar Stage Theatre, and Sext, Sex Education by Theatre, and so many others in Toronto St. Paul's. I encourage us all to celebrate our theatre, support our theatre, our theatre workers, our art educators, and art producers. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the government side for their assistance. I appreciate it very much. Point of order, the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Nassim Beg from the Ahmadiyya community visiting us in Queen's Park. Welcome in Queen's Park. <laughs> member for Mississauga, Malton, on a point. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd also like to take the opportunity to welcome Mr. Naveed Ahmed Khan, Hadi Ali Chaudhry, Mukhtar Chima, and Abid Makbul, along with Mirja Naseem Beg from Mississauga. Thank you for coming to the Prince Park. Okay. We have a deferred vote on the amendment to government notice of motion number 33 relating to allocation of time on Bill 74, an act concerning the provision of health care, continuing Ontario health, and making consequential and related amendments and repeals. Call on the members. This is a five minute bell.
We've closed the doors. I'm going to ask the members now to take their seats. On March 26, 2019, Mr. Besaw moved an amendment to Government Notice of Motion No. 33 relating to allocation of time on Bill 74. All those in favour of Mr. Besaw's motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Besaw. Mr. Besaw. Madam Jelinek. Jelinek. Mr. Tabb. Mr. Tabb. Ms. Singh Brampton Centre. Ms. Singh Brampton Centre. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Ray Kosovich. Mr. Kosovich. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. All those opposed to Mr. Bisson's motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Bethlenfall. Mr. Bethlenfall. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliot. Ms. Elliot. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Ms. McNaught. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Down. Mr. Down. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Ms. Sermon. Ms. Sermon. Mr. Parsa. Mr. Parsa. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Sakari. Mr. Sakari. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamar. Ms. Gamar. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carr Hollings. Mrs. Carr Hollings. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Smith Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith Peterborough Court. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mr. Baum. Mr. Baum. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Anon. Mr. Anon. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. T Canapathy. Mr. Canapathy. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babbitt. Mr. Babbitt. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanagaslin. Mr. Tanagaslin. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Sabau. The ayes are 44, the nays are 70. The ayes are 44, the nays being 70. I declare the motion lost. Is the House prepared to vote on the main motion? Yes. Ms. Elliott has moved government notice of motion number 33 relating to allocation of time on Bill 74, an act concerning the provision of health care, continuing Ontario health, and making consequential and related amendments and repeals. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? Yes. No. All those in favour of the motion will please say aye. aye. All those opposed will please say nay. nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be. Five minute bell.
Ms. Elliott has moved Government mo Notice of Motion number 33 relating to the allocation of time on Bill 74. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith Bay of Princeton. Mr. Bay of Princeton. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethenfall. Mr. Bethenfall. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Mr. Miller Perry Sound Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Down. Mr. Down. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Kalandra. Mr. Kalandra. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Mr. Parsons. Mr. Parsons. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Triantan Philopolis. Ms. Triantan Philopolis. Mr. Sakari. Mr. Sakari. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carr Holly. Mrs. Carr Holly. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Mr. Smith Peterborough Quartz. Mr. Smith Peterborough Quartz. Mr. Kanjan. Mr. Kanjan. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cram. Mr. Cram. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Tang. Mrs. Tang. Mr. Baum. Mr. Baum. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Kanapath. Mr. Kanapath. Mr. Babikia. Mr. Babikia. Mr. Babb. Mr. Babb. Mr. Pay. Mr. Pay. Mr. Tanagasla. Mr. Tanagasla. Mr. Robert. Mr. Robert. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Sabau. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be counted by the Mr. Bissell. Mr. Bissell. Madam Gellin. Madam Gellin. Mr. Tapp. Mr. Tapp. Mr. Singh Brampton Center. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Bantos. Mr. Bantos. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Mr. Singh, Brampton East. Mr. Singh, Brampton East. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Birch. Ms. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosovich. Mr. Rakosovich. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Mont Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Shriner. Mr. Shrine. Madam De Rossi. Madam De Rossi. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. The ayes are 70, the nays are 44. The ayes being 70 and the nays being 44, I declare the motion carried. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.